In South Florida, you've got a 13 mile stretch between the Everglades to the west and the Atlantic Ocean to the east. Mm -hmm. So you've got limited land and you've got millions, right, of people wanting to live down here. Miami Beach average sale prices there up 72%. Got prices up double digits in Boca, Wellington, Bal Harbor, Delray, all across Southern Florida. Miami's a new city. And you go back to 1920 and there was this guy named Carl Fisher. He was selling waterfront lots in Miami Beach. An acre on the water in Miami Beach for guess how much money? 50 bucks. $500. 500. Fast forward, the Austin Martin Residences site in downtown Miami that's on the water is like a $100 million acre. A lot of people make fun of brokers. They're just like sleazy car salesmen. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm like, that's the playground where I want to compete. When you think about a young person who wants to get into real estate, like what's your best advice for them? All right, guys, bang, bang, I've got Omar here with me. Uh, you've sold $3 billion worth of real estate in South Florida. Yep. Uh, and a lot of people think it's over. Like prices are down 10, 20%. Uh, the Fed is acting all crazy. Are people still moving to Miami? It's like, well, shit, let's just talk about it. Yeah. Um, I think a great place to start is like, why South Florida? Right. I don't think that's a place that many people historically were like, if you're a young person who wants to have a great career in real estate, like, oh, move to Miami. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about like why South Florida's always been so interesting to you and like why yeah. did you stay here rather than go to a New York or a California or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me. This is a uh, wild, pretty crazy to be here and obviously know some of the people you've interviewed and being here with them is just like, wow, okay, I'm I'm not at that level, but I'm getting there. And uh why South Florida? So for me personally, it was just family. My family's here and I'm from Honduras, so it was close by. So it just made sense. And a lot of success is luck-based. Uh, I feel like you'd be fooling luck's yourself. Luck's not real. To, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you, you're luck's one on real. that. You're like, it's not luck. It's like you worked for it, right? No, no. It's you, probability. You cre Okay. Uh, probability. We can go luck. at length about this. I'm luck big on this. luck. I'm big on luck and gratitude. Yeah, it's but just luck's like, fake. No, luck, dude. Listen, this will be a, now this will be a podcast about fine. luck and <laughs> gratitude. I, I'm out of about luck yeah. is a psychological concept. If you and I walk out of here and then uh -huh. get hit by a car, uh -huh. right? You're unlucky, bro. No, no <laughs> you may be like, oh, I was unlucky because I got hit by the car. But yeah. I may be like, yo, I was lucky because I survived. Yeah. It's all psychological. It's True. probability, True. probability of like, hey, you were walking there, you got hit by the car or whatever. Uh -huh. It's mathematical concept, uh -huh. it's probability. Okay, so but the probability, okay, so here, okay, I'll go back for it. I'll All take right. the word luck out of it. Not that I agree, <laughs> not that I agree, not that I agree, but just to appease you and to talk about <laughs> so real estate to, and to talk to about South sure Florida. Probability versus luck. Is, is bifurcated, yeah. yeah. So for me, my parents had the prob probabilistically were like, let's get out of Honduras and let's get into Miami. I came to Miami and I was like, this place has everything I think I need, right? Mm -hmm. Including family, which is the most sort of pressing part. So basically, when I was graduating, I had offers to go do investment banking in New York and Chicago and things like that. The reason I stayed, again, was for family. But what I ended up realizing very quickly was Malcolm Gladwell talks about this and David and Goliath about being a big fish in a small pond. Mm -hmm. So pretty much when I, I got an internship at a hedge fund, which is a huge breakthrough for me, friends of friends connected me. And um at the hedge fund, it sort of opened my eyes and gave me sort of like the in to be able to get into real estate and financial investment at a high level, right? But what I noticed was that this hedge fund could not find hardworking talent, young in Miami. Because mm. to your point, which what you just asked is like, why Miami, right? Like why not New York, Chicago and all these things? So for me, that became a huge like boon to my career because very quickly, once I got into real estate, private equity and now brokeraging, um, my name sort of started coming around a lot because I instantly started dealing, having, doing deals with these big players. Mm -hmm. um, and I was the sort of only one of very few young guys working their asses off day in and day out. Um, so that for me was like kind of what got me to where we, I am today, which we'll talk about. But I think the reason why people like South Florida and the reason why it'll continue growing is because for the first time ever, you're seeing this demographic shift, which I think is so interesting. It's Florida historically has been a retirement community. Mm -hmm. That's why people come here, mm -hmm. right? Now you've got downsizing baby boomers whose kids are out of the house all over New York, the Northeast, I mean, across the country. And they, Florida has historically been the place where they go, right? What's interesting now is now their sons that are 19, 22, 27, listening to you or... Um, what's the pen floor, the pen gaming guy? Um, uh, Dave Portnoy. Dave Portnoy. Dave Portnoy, like they're in, they're in Miami, they're in South Florida, they're here. So for the first time ever, you've got the two largest 
demographic populations both having a reason to come down here, mm -hmm. right? So that's huge. And for me, I see it where, hey, the kid wants to come to Miami to work in Miami and live in this sort of paradise. And their parents are moving down here too. So now the whole family is getting back together in Miami or Fort Lauderdale or Palm Beach. So for me, that's extremely unique. Real estate has always been, and I'm sure you've had guys and people probably listening to this, real estate is a tried and true asset. It's very similar to Bitcoin in terms of like, hard, you can't make more of it, things like that. Um, good inflation hedge. So they're not, you're not making more real estate. And in South Florida, you've got a 13 mile stretch between the Everglades to the west and the Atlantic Ocean to the east. Mm -hmm. So you've got limited land and you've got millions, right, of people wanting to live down here. Yeah, it's getting expensive and it'll keep, it'll continue to get expensive. But when you're talking about that you can get a two bedroom apartment in the middle of the city in Brickell for 500 grand, 600 grand, that in New York has to be one, two, one, five million dollars. And like, Easy. A neat, like, not like an impressive one just to live there, right? So like, we're still half priced. And a lot of these employers are coming down here. So that for like many other reasons I could dive into, like the demographics, I think is super interesting. The weather, uh, tax friendly the climate. The hmm? demographics. So no, demographics is that both the downsizing, the older baby boomers and the younger guys both want to be here. It's not just one or the other now, mm -hmm. right? It's like, hey, my MD, my managing director at my shop is moving to Palm Beach. I want to go and live in Fort Lauderdale yeah. and take the bright line up and down work. So now you've got both of them coming down got here. It. Right. So for me to have friends that go to Harvard, Warden, MIT, Stanford, and for them telling me that Miami is a Def target destination blows my mind. And that's only starting. Right. Mm -hmm. Because what I think is most interesting about population migration that a lot of people, I think, underestimate is that whenever you see a trend in anything in crypto and in investments or whatever the trend may be, you think, OK, are you going to get reversion to the mean? Or are you going to get perpetuating sort of like network effects, mm -hmm. right? Is it going to continue? And I think population migration has perpetuating self-reinforcing network effects where the more people move down here, the more people want to move down here, the more they wake up in the blistering cold or the blistering heat, whether it be out in the Midwest or in Baltimore, Maryland, freezing their asses off one winter day. They open up their phone and they've got you in Miami, Dave Portnoy in Miami, some actress or model or book writer or whatever it is, Ken Griffin in Miami. They're like, holy shit, everybody's going there. And then their parents are like, hey, we're looking to buy a house in Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. Right. So for that to just continue trickling in, I really think Miami's in the first inning and it's it's we're scratching the surface of what the city is going to become. So a lot of people, when they think of uh, real estate, they think of single family homes uh, or apartments. You deal with multifamilies for the most part. Talk a little bit as to like, why is multifamily in South Florida so interesting? And like, why are you so focused on that part of the market? Absolutely. So. Again, here I'll use the word luck. I fell into multifamily <laughs> by luck, but probabilistically, a lot of people were buying multifamily. So when I broke into real estate, I, by the probability was that there was more people buying multi than like hotel, office, retail, things like that. So I fell into a shop that did multifamily. As I was learning and cutting my teeth with it, I'm like, holy shit, this is a really good investment. So the reason why it's so good, it's because COVID came, right? And hotels completely stopped, right? Office, work from home, completely stopped. Retail, e-commerce, completely, not completely stopped, but took a big hit. Mm -hmm. So all these asset classes within the real estate umbrella have really seen some hard times and residential has too, but it always comes back because as long as you get good real estate at a good location, somebody's going to pay to have a roof over their head. Mm -hmm. That's never going to change. You need somewhere to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. Hotel is different. Co economy hits a recession, people travel less, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with office, retail, and other asset classes. So the three big asset classes, which have weathered a lot of the storms and and had have been like a hedge for inflation, real estate naturally is, is multifamily, industrial, and self-storage. Mm -hmm. For different reasons, multifamily for me was one where like, I understood why I wanted to live in Brickell versus Coral Gables and why somebody would rather be in Delray Beach over Pompano Beach or Fort Lauderdale or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, other locations in South Florida. So for me, it's like, OK, I kind of I can sell this and I can pitch this and I believe it because I'm living and breathing it. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And for you, for example, with like crypto, what you're really known for, it's like you live and breathe crypto. Like you understand the coins and the tokenomics and like what these people are thinking. So you're like pot committed. So you're confidence in the investment like mm -hmm. just like flows through you mm -hmm. so for me that was multifamily, and to answer your question about residential which is like single family homes mom and pop stuff to multi to multifamily, which is like an apartment building like the people that follow grant cardone look like he buys apartment buildings and stuff it's if you buy a house you've got your biggest expenses outside of real estate and real estate taxes and insurance your biggest expenses are um capex capital expenditures right so like a roof mm -hmm. an air conditioning unit things like that so in a house you've got one roof one tenant mm -hmm. right that roof goes bad like that's going to be a bad year for you because that tenant's paying you two thousand a month but the roof goes bad you owe 30 grand 50 mm -hmm. grand whatever it could be so in a multifamily building you've got a building with 80 units, 80 different tenants paying you monthly mm -hmm. or 150 tenants. You know, we've sold 600 tenant buildings, like 600 unit buildings that only have six roofs, have eight roofs, have two roofs. So basically this big ticket item is sort of cushioned by the amount of people paying you. And then if your tenant leaves in a single family home, you're going to see no income for the next month or two months or three months, depending how hot that market is at any given time. Within multifamily, You've got 800, call it 100 people in your building. Mm -hmm. One leaves, another one comes in. Two leave, another one comes in. You literally need like 20 people to say, hey, I no longer want to live in this building at any price point that you can put in front of me for you to start like thinking, okay, I've got a loan, I got to pay down, mm -hmm. right? So it's such a safe investment. It's so resilient and it's got all the benefits that real estate generally has that it's like the hottest asset class within real estate. Mm -hmm. So I fell into it by luck or by probability. And it's just been a wild ride. I'm sure you could, I mean, I even want to ask you, I'm like, you, I'm sure you, you stumbled upon Bitcoin mm -hmm. years ago, probably earlier than most. Mm -hmm. And the more you read on it, you're like, holy shit, this is really cool. Yeah. Oh my God, this is really cool. And yeah. then as you're like, guys, guys, and you're like telling people and kind of waking people up and shaking them to it, you're, you're more and more pot committed as you're doing mm -hmm. it, right? Of course. So for me, it's been, call it seven years now that I've just been, helping people invest in multifamily in South Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and now, yeah, it's been $3 billion of sales, mind you, with a team. So for me, it's me and five teams, two of, two of which, me and five team members, two of which are like support analyst type roles, mm -hmm. and then three, which are like client facing and mm -hmm. closing deals and trying to like negotiate contracts and stuff. Got it. Yeah. Uh, you guys are brokers. Brokers, correct. When most people think of investing in real estate, they think of like some rich billionaire who like wants to go and, and put their money into the real estate and the the principal gets all the glory. Yeah. But what's unique about you all is that you're brokers. You're actually helping people buy and sell. Yeah. Um, and you don't want to be the principal in a lot of cases based on conversation we've had in the past. Explain yeah. like, why do you like being the broker? Yeah, it's, it's a unique perspective, I think. Um, I want to see where I start. So <laughs> yeah, cause there's a lot that goes into it and, and I think I need to start high level. So uh, people listening, cause it's nuanced differences, right? I think the general takeaway for me was it's actually a Warren Buffett quote that says uh, profits come and go, mm -hmm. but fees never falter. Mm -hmm. Right. If I'm selling a building for a hundred million dollars, call it, let's say I'm making one million dollars in commission. Right. If that building falls to 80 million dollar value, I'm making 800 grand. Right. Mm -hmm. If it skyrockets to 120 million dollars, I'm making one point two million dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with a team of five people, it ends up being a very lucrative sort of investment when you're splitting those 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 fees. Um, I'm in the, I'm, I'm at a shop called Burcadia, which is like the brokerage house and they get some of that fee. But what ends up happening is it's like a time irrelevant investment, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. where you could be the smartest guy in the world, smartest fucking person. If you bought real estate in 2006 and raised a bunch of money because you wanted to have a three year flip into 2011, 2010, like you lost a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. And in the investment world, especially when you're dealing with bigger properties, if you lose money once, mm -hmm. I mean, you could probably speak to if you like your, your spigots dried up, like you're like, you're done, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, brokeraging has this financial term, it's called sharp ratio, which is basically like 
the volatility the volatility relative to the marginal return on like how successful you're going to be mm -hmm. typically it's an investment so it's like yeah this investment might make me a little bit more money but i could go broke or i could go bust or make a little bit more money so that's a bad investment right the reason why people want to be principals and bgps is because it allows people to look at a billionaire like George Perez or a Stephen Ross or maybe more local people like David Martin and stuff like that and be like, wow, I want to be that dude, right? And I'm like, dude, for every guy that's like that, there is 100,000 people trying to be that dude, mm -hmm. A. B, I've talked to those guys. I've sold deals to them and for them. I've sold deals that they've built and I've sold it for them. These guys, it's, it's realistically like looking at a Tom Brady or Cristiano Ronaldo or LeBron James and being like, I want to be that dude. Mm -hmm. The reason I say that is because these guys on a Saturday night, midnight, Sunday morning, 7 a.m., they're like calling and they're, they're what, I don't know if this is like a, a bad term, but like, I don't think they'd mind it if I would tell them. They're like deal junkies. They mm -hmm. fucking love real estate and like finding the deal, cutting the deal and making it happen. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, I see that and I'm like, okay, like that's my competition if I want to be them, mm -hmm. right? Brokers, which I think a lot of the people listening to this could probably relate. A lot of people make fun of brokers. Those guys don't know what they're talking about. They're always selling me numbers that don't really match up and, and they're just like sleazy car salesmen. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm like, that's the playground where I want to compete. Mm -hmm. I want to compete against a guy that's got like a poor reputation and can't add two and two, mm -hmm. right? So by playing in that space, and now for me, especially in South Florida multifamily, when we're selling $100 million buildings, there's five shops that do that. Mm -hmm. Nobody goes to a random mom and pop broker and says, hey, I want, I want George Perez isn't going to go to a random Joe Schmo and says, I want you to sell this building for $100 million. He's going to go to a shop that's got the clientele and the network that can sell $100 million buildings. Mm -hmm. And those shops, there's five of them here. Bercadia mm -hmm. is one of them. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, all right, I'm competing against five dudes. Mm -hmm. Last year, especially when the market was red hot, we sold a 308-unit building in Sunny Isles. Price ended up getting close to, call it $130 million, give or take. We had 24 offers in writing of different groups across the country, really. There were international folks, New York folks, everywhere, that basically said, I can pay close to $130 million for this building. 24 groups that are backed, have the track record. Out of those 24 groups that actually gave us written LOIs for this asset, there was 500 phone calls that we had, and there was an extra 50 people that were like, I can pay 110 million, I can pay 115 million, but I can't get to 120, 125, 130. So for me, when I'm selling one of these hot assets that you want to own in a prime location in a primary market, I see the competition. Mm -hmm. It's a thousand fucking people with a lot of money that are very smart and well-backed. Then I look at the brokeraging side and it's like people that are just trying to like make a quick buck or very short-term focused and have largely a bad reputation as an industry. So being that like one bright light, you know, amongst many, gives, I think, me the leverage long term to kind of be where I want to be. And then that relative to, hey, I'm also not taking any risk, mm -hmm. right? I'm not taking any risks. So I could have a great year and make call it $2 million. I could have a bad year and only make 100 grand, 300 grand. That's, that's the bad part about brokeraging. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's from a career perspective, why, why it makes sense. There's other things to touch on, but I want to pause how much, and see how much, question. Uh, like how much do brokers get paid fee-wise? Like, does it vary? Yeah, it does vary a lot. So that's another good question, actually. So when you sell a million dollar deal, you can charge, you know, call it a 3% fee. And like hey, a residential deal, people would charge 3% on, and both uh, real estate agents get paid 3%. So it's like 6% total. Correct. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So for me, it's like, Hey, million dollar deal, $60,000 is going to go to brokers, mm -hmm. right? When you go to an a hundred million dollar deal, you don't go and it's not a $6 million fee. Mm -hmm. Like many things in life, it's like the bigger you get, it doesn't really get more complicated. Sometimes mm -hmm. it even gets easier. Cause when I'm selling a deal from Blackstone to related or whatever it is, it's like, they've got their stuff buttoned down. Like mm -hmm. everything's single file line. When you go and sell a $2 million deal from a mom and pop that's owned it for 20 years, it's like 
oh, the guy on the left, uh, my tenant over there, yeah, he pays me cash on a napkin every other month. And I'm like, well, how do I how do I pitch this to yeah. a guy to buy it? So fee-wise, it varies. I want to say, generally speaking, you know, between a $5 million deal or a $100 million deal, you're making anywhere from like 400 grand on like the low end to like a million dollars on the high end. Like a million dollar fee is like special, it's unique and you really knocked it out of the park for your client and like a nuanced deal, mm -hmm. right? A cookie cutter deal that's like, hey, it's a beautiful building, people are gonna love it, you're gonna sell it. Like the client knows that he's giving you a easy sell mm -hmm. for the most part. And they're negotiating. And, and they'll negotiate. Like, hey, do you wanna sell a big sexy building in Brickell? Like I know you do, right? So like instead of, and we're not gonna go and charge them a million dollars, it'll be, you know, call it half a million or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of things that go into it, like client relationship. Is it the first time you're going to work with this guy? If it is, you want to be a little more lenient on pricing mm -hmm. to kind of win over the business longer term, things like that. Mm -hmm. But typically you're making, you can ballpark at 500 to a million dollars per closing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You mentioned earlier some people, uh, Ken Griffin, Stephen Ross, uh, George Perez. What, what makes these people special? Like what, why are they so good at it? You mentioned earlier like being a deal junkie, but what else? This episode is brought to you by 8sleep. Good sleep is a game changer and the 8sleep pod is the best sleep machine. I sleep on it every single night. A great night of sleep allows you to be healthier, be more rested, and have more energy throughout the day. And on the brand new 8sleep pod 3, you can sleep as cold as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret of thermoregulation. Better sleep, better energy. Get yourself an eight sleep. You can go to eightsleep.com slash pomp today to go ahead and get $150 off your order. Eightsleep.com slash pomp. Not only do I sleep on it every night, it literally changed my life and I begged the founders to let me invest in the company. Eightsleep.com slash pomp. Go get yourself an eight sleep pod and get a better night of sleep. So the overarching actual like the nuance that I've noticed in all of them is they are hyper- hyper responsive crazy if you have a deal that they're looking for you send them a text you send them an email and they are responding within seven minutes it could be friday night it could be sunday morning so i think it just goes back to like okay if they're that incessant about like just responding and getting in front of you i can't imagine behind the scenes how much more they're studying and talking and, and doing all these things so Doing a deal with them is different from like knowing them personally, but it's, it's, it's that it's, I, I can, they're like foaming at the mouth for real estate. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think if you think of someone like Michael Jordan, right. It's like, whether he had a fever, whether he was sick, whether he was whatever, he was going to practice. He was giving his a thousand percent every time at practice, his teammates gave him a hard time because he was such a hard ass at practice, but he's just like, he's foaming at the mouth for this like opportunity day in and day out. Mm -hmm. And I think our economy sort of like self-selects where it's like you have to be that way to be the 1%, not financially, but be the 1% in an industry. If you want to be the 1% in soccer, in crypto, in Twitter, in media, you just have to live and breathe your product. And it's exactly what they do. It's for me, it's inspiring. Honestly, it's, you know, I graduated with that sentiment. Like I want to be these people. And like, realistically, I see their life and I'm like, wow. I mean, I like multifamily. I like South Florida but I also like hanging out with my friends, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I don't think that's a wrong thing, but it's just like having that perspective, I think is is good. And and that's kind of what, what makes them them, right? Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes I meet like a 32 year old, much younger that doesn't have their prestige and all those things yet. And I'm like, dude, this guy's got what it takes. And I'll tell them, I'm like, dude, I know you're young and this is your second deal, but like, you're killing it. You're gonna go far, like, let's keep in touch. Cause I see in you what I see in these 45, 55, mm -hmm. six year old people. Are there any people like that that you can name? Like that you're like, watch this person? Uh, Just pick one. So now, who, now whoever you don't name is going to be mad. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> it. I'm like, now there's going to be 10 of those guys that are like, dude, well, come on, you named this guy and not me? Uh, I'll, 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 I'll pass on that. I'll pass on uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough uh, one. You, you told me that there's this book, The New Kings of New York, I think it's yeah. called. What, what, explain a little bit of what happened in New York and like why are some of these people now in uh, Miami? Do they think yeah. they can just kind of run back the playbook or uh, something else? Yeah, so I think New York – 
and I can't really speak to it. I wasn't someone that lived there for a bunch of years and I don't know all the politics and stuff like that, but it's an older city, right? Especially when you compare it to Miami. Um, so the new Kings of New York, that book specifically talks about a lot of like, sort of like the new Titans that are there now. So Stephen Ross being one of them, uh, Zeckendorf, Harry Macklow, all these guys that were fighting for and bidding and winning 500 million, $2 billion buildings. What I like about that book is that they're talking about New York. And as I'm seeing and reading about this cast and crew, they're, if not all in Miami or in South Florida, they're making big plans to come over here, mm -hmm. right? Even Maclo had um, an investment in Dadeland that came out in the newspapers that I think he either funded or was going to fund. Stephen Ross has made a huge splash over here. So what I think is interesting about Miami, where going back to where in the first inning relative to New York, is Miami is a new city, very, very new city. And you go back, oh, you'd like this. It'll be a good question for you. You go back 100 years, right? So we're in, call it 2020, right? You go back to 1920, you go back to 1920, and there was this guy named Carl Fisher. Okay. And if you've heard of Fisher Island, yep. that's Carl Fisher. He was selling waterfront lots mm -hmm. in Miami Beach, an acre on the water in Miami Beach for guess how much money? 50 bucks. Wow, that's actually a really good guess. Yeah, what, yeah. what is it? $500. 500 For an acre yeah. on the water in Miami Beach, mm -hmm. right? Fast forward, the Austin Martin Residences site in downtown Miami that's on the water is like a $100 million acre wow. for land. Ken Griffin that just bought um, 2.5 acres on a parking lot next to Jade, uh, mm -hmm. Ocean right here. It's in Brickell. Mm -hmm. It's a water. It's a 2.5 acre waterfront lot in Brickell. 363 million dollars, <sighs> which is 150 million dollars the acre. Mm -hmm. Fifty dollars he was selling waterfront lots for mm -hmm. on Miami Beach. Crazy. Miami Beach is it's it's insane. So what's interesting is because South Florida is so new, it's 100 years old tops. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure is also very new. So you've got people like um, Wes Edens of Fortress Investment Group that's funding the Bright Line, mm -hmm. right? That's starting right now. Go and try to create a Bright Line in New York, right? Because the metro is what old and smelly and dense, whatever it may be. It's already there. You're not moving New York. You're not mm -hmm. replacing, and I can't speak to this technically, but like you're not replacing the, insist, the existing infrastructure mm -hmm. in New York. Why it, is Wes doing that? It's a capitalistic pursuit. Like they're going to make money on the bright line it's, or, or it, is it a, phil a philanthropic? I think a little of both. Okay. I think when you get to his level of wealth, you're not, you know, maximizing profit isn't like the end all be all. It's mm -hmm. like, Hey, I hope it pencils, but like, I want to do this for, you know, the people in the mm -hmm. country and it could be an ego on another man personally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, and I think you could read about it. It's like, they're losing money, you know, day in and day out mm -hmm. and pretty much, so if you look at downtown Miami, where the Bright Line starts down here, they have a whole mixed use project around it, right? So mm -hmm. they've got office towers that Blackstone now owns. Mm -hmm. It's a good example. Blackstone goes and leases 40,000 square feet of office space in downtown Miami. Mm -hmm. Six months later, they're buying the building for $250 million, mm -hmm. right? So again, this is starting to happen, right? And then one Blackstone owns and Brookfield Asset Management and all these players. So going back to Wes Edens, he basically... I believe is now selling like park line, uh, aside from the office buildings that he built there that he sold, there's apartment towers that ended up selling recently for like $450 million. Mm -hmm. So he's creating the nucleus with the bright line. Mm -hmm. Then he's selling the assets to then continue funding the bright line. Cause he wants to create like the largest private railroad, you know, public transit, um, uh, system in Florida. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there's a lot of intentions to why he's doing it, but he's going to open the Aventura right now. It's, it's, you can bright line from Miami to Fort Lauderdale to West Palm beach. Right. Mm -hmm. He's opening the Aventura station either this month in December or January, it'll be fully open. And then he's going to have Orlando. He's going to have Tampa. So going back to just like how, how early of a city Florida is and South Florida specifically, 
it's like we can see what Chicago, Boston, New York did right or did wrong from an urban planning perspective and like mitigate those issues. Mm -hmm. Let's break down a deal. Like let's say someone wants to buy a $100 million deal. How much money do they have to put in? How much of it's debt? Uh, are there other considerations? Like what, what goes into a $100 million uh, multifamily purchase? Yeah. So a lot less than most people think. Okay, explain. For sure. So when people say I own a $100 million deal, you know, that's not $100 million that they could sell and then have cash equivalent in their bank account. So I'll explain to you what's called the capital stack, which is like, okay, you've got a $100 million deal. How does that break down? Mm -hmm. Right? So call it 60% of that is a loan from a bank, right? So someone's lending you 60% of that asset. So call it $60 million comes from a bank. Then you've got $40 million of equity, which is the remaining capital that you've got to fill up. Out of that $40 million, let's say this acquisition was happening by Pomp Capital Partners, mm -hmm. right? You've got to now raise $40 million of equity. Typically, you raise that, you do 90% by limited partners. So you go out and raise 90% of that money and you fund 10% of it. So out of that $40 million, you're funding personally $4 million and you're going to go raise $36 million, mm -hmm. right? The interesting thing is that then the personal pump capital partners, $4 million tranche, that could be us here in this room, each putting a million dollars, right? So it's four guys that got together $4 million within Palm Capital, mm -hmm. who then raised $36 million, who then got from a bank $60 million for this $100 million building. Mm -hmm. And then typically how it works is from an investment standpoint, the $60 million, the bank has like the safest return, but no upside. Mm -hmm. The limited partners that come in for $36 million, they've got like the second safest return and some of the upside, mm -hmm. right? Because they're taking more risk. And then us four in this room putting a million dollars each have the most risk, but the most upside. Mm -hmm. What is, when you say uh, the LPs have some of the upside, what does that look like? So typically in real estate investments, they'll promise you like a six to 8% return mm -hmm. a year in your money. So out of that $36 million, that could be one person giving you a $36 million check, which will be a big institutional group. Mm -hmm. Or you can go and find... 36 one million dollar checks right mm -hmm. what you're promising to those people is like hey if you give me a million dollars i will return to you six percent preferred return and then once we sell the asset or refinance it and have a capital event and we get all this money back once you get your full million dollars back and your six percent return or eight percent return whatever it's negotiated that's accrued to you then we go and split the funds Instead of 90-10, which is how you came into the deal, 90% LP, 10% GP, instead of 90-10, then we'll go and split the funds 80-20, up to a 12% return. Mm -hmm. Then once we've given you a 12% return, every dollar that comes in after a 12% return, we're going to split it 70-30. Mm -hmm. So how it looks like when you have an investment that has a 40% return, right, is your million dollar, our four guy million dollar investment goes and becomes a four, five, six, seven equity multiple, right? It like escalates really, really quickly while the LP sort of like tapers off a little bit because the more money we're making them, the high, the, the more upside we're getting from mm -hmm. it. The so higher percentage. The, the higher percentage. So typically it's a six to 8% preferred return. That's like, you're getting that yes or yes. And then after that, after a 12% return, you get a little bit less of the upside. After a 20% return, you get a little bit less. It's all how you structure it. Mm -hmm. And most of the individuals who are running these firms, are there other fees that they're charging uh, in terms of uh, it? Obviously, they're going to get their carry, right, which is the 20% or whatever. Yeah. Uh, they're going to probably get some management fees. Uh, but on like individual deals, are there fees as well that they end up taking? Or like, how does that work? Yeah. So there's like deal level returns, which is like, hey, this is what the asset is going to give mm -hmm. us. And then there's like net to investors. Mm -hmm. So your typical fees is an acquisition fee, an asset management fee, a property management fee, and then sometimes a disposition fee. Mm -hmm. So those are your typical fees. I want to say largely, because I know you're going to ask, like, what do those fees look like and where should they of be course. at? Yeah. 
Um, so largely call it an acquisition fee will be one to 2%. Mm -hmm. It obviously varies if you're buying a billion dollar asset, mm -hmm. right? Versus a $5 million asset. But typically an acquisition fee, which you pay to the sponsor for closing on that asset is one to 2%. Why are you paying them that one to 2%? Because yes, they're closing on this asset, mostly with your money, but to close on this asset, they went and underwrote and looked at 150 properties of course with people that they were paying hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in salary to fly out to Florida and fly out to Fort Lauderdale and fly out this So a one to two percent acquisition acquisition fee Typically also like a one to two percent asset management fee, which this is like doing k-1s and a bunch of back-end things mm -hmm. that gets paid You do a three to five percent management fee, right? Three percent for these larger 300 unit buildings five percent to these smaller 50 unit buildings, right? Because mm -hmm. it's more nominal, it's, it's nominally less dollars. And then you've got disposition fees. Hey, we're selling this thing. Now we get, that's like 50 basis points if they even add it. Mm -hmm. So typically what you see doing it, what you see sponsors doing is if it's their first deal, they're be the most lenient with fees because what they want to build is a track record. Mm -hmm. So I'm invested in a deal um, with a partner where they're like, hey, this is our first deal. I knew them from a while back because they used to be ex Blackstone mm -hmm. type guys. So I'm like, these guys are very sharp, very smart, but they're sort of being lenient on fees because they need to build a track record. Mm -hmm. So they were doing like a 1% acquisition fee. It was a 1% asset management fee, a 3% management fee and no disposition fee. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, these guys are as sharp as the Blackstone guys and they're basically charging me no fees. Right. And they're just on the upside of the opportunity itself. Great. As that group's grown, I think they bought over a billion dollars worth of real estate last year. Mm -hmm. As that group's grown and more and more people want to give them money, mm -hmm. they start having more leverage to be like, hey, Omar, we're raising money again in case you want to come in on this deal. But it's now it's a 2% acquisition fee, 2% disposition fee. Like, and they'll go and do more market rate expenses because now they have the leverage. They have people that yeah. want to give them money. Yeah, it's all uh, supply and demand. All supply and demand. Yeah. How should people think about, uh, they get pitched all the time, whether it's technology products, whether it's individual uh, GPs on the internet, whether it's somebody that uh, they got introduced to by their friend or whatever uh, that's raising money for a real estate deal. Like how yeah. do you underwrite who uh, you would give your money to or who you wouldn't? Like what are things that uh, you look for? What are red flags? What are things that uh, yeah. you're like, okay, this, this is a signal that this person knows what they're talking about? It's definitely case by case, but I think, my number one thing is track record. It's like, let me see how many deals you've purchased and how those deals did. And then also you want to see how much experience do they have in that submarket, mm -hmm. right? Generally speaking, you want to do business. If you want to get exposure to multifamily assets in South Florida, you want to do it with the team that's done five, 10, 15 deals here successfully. Mm -hmm. You're probably less inclined to do it with the team that's like very successful in Michigan but is now doing their first, their first South Florida deal. Mm -hmm. We had a client once where that was sort of the what happened. They were out of towners and they were doing a deal in Coral Gables and they put one of their leasing agents that couldn't speak Spanish because they're from Michigan and they don't know this. And they were like, dude, like the buildings around us are killing it and ours isn't doing so hot. And I didn't find out for them, but I found out this was the issue. Their whole staff didn't speak a lick of Spanish. If you've been in Miami, you got to speak some Spanish. Spanish is actually the language <laughs> of South Florida. English is a nice to have. <laughs> exactly. Actually, though. Yeah, the fr I'm so, not joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You order your food in Spanish. Yeah, it's interesting. Some people like it. And the people that don't, you can go to Fort Lauderdale yeah. or Palm Beach. <laughs> We've got it all in South Florida. So um, that's that's one, one example of something to look at, which is like, okay, what's their track record look like in the specific submarket? Mm -hmm. Another thing is fees. I just spoke about them. Obviously, if they're charging you crazy, outrageous fees, it's like, wait, no. Yeah. Um, that's another thing. But realistically, you want to have someone generally, like Pomp, if you're investing in multifamily in South Florida, mm -hmm. yeah, you get a confidential private placement memorandum sent to you. It's kind of like, hey, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, Omar, have you ever heard of these guys? Mm -hmm. And I get that question all the time. And I've sold a lot of multifamily in South Florida mm -hmm. when my friends send me these investments and I'm like, I have never fucking heard of this person in my life mm -hmm. and they don't have a website mm -hmm. and I've never seen like, that's when you're like red flags are popping out. Mm -hmm. Once you're dealing with like, it, it, I think venture is very similar, right? Where it's like, yeah, Stripe, great company. Mm -hmm. Hey, Omar, 
I want to like pump. Can you get, I, I got 50 grand. Can you put it in Stripe for me? You're mm -hmm. like, yeah, good fucking luck. Like you need series. I don't know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, and you need yeah. to have access. Mm -hmm. That's where it gets very interesting being a broker where I have access to the best GPs, the best sponsors mm -hmm. who are ov always over allocated on their investments. If they need to raise $10 million, they're going to find it. Because for the last 15 years, 40 years, they've made money for their investors. Mm -hmm. So what I do is tell these groups like, hey, can you carve out some money for me? Or can you carve out some money for my friend? Mm -hmm. The reason they do that is because we're the ones that sell the deals to them, mm -hmm. right? So when I'm selling a deal to XYZ firm, we could have sold that deal to the other guy that maybe had the same offer with the same deposits and the same terms. But we really told the seller like, hey, this guy is like, he's never done us any wrong. He's a great guy. That guy, yeah, it's the same terms on paper, but like we don't really know him. We've never dealt with him, right? Mm -hmm. So the sponsors also want the brokers that are sort of controlling these deals in, in, in some respect, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the seller has a final say wants the brokers on their side. Mm -hmm. And when I get a deal that's like under the table, like, hey, I don't want you to market this, but I need you to close this deal for this price. I call my top five guys, my top 10 guys. Mm -hmm. Those top five guys, those top 10 guys give me like private access to their investments. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, like Omar funds go to those guys, which are like over allocated, tried and true, charge market rate fees and have a huge track record. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. What are like the biggest risks that people should pay attention to? risks um like there's like outright fraud and that, and that type of stuff but like, correct like, yeah i was gonna say but like that's hard to sort of gauge a yeah. track record is a good way to gauge for that um yeah. and the actual investment yeah like, I, like if you're doing a multifamily investment what are like the two or three things you're like okay these are the risks that i always check for yeah pretty quickly so if somebody sends you a package which says hey you should invest with us look at this investment that we have under contract that we're going to close on the number one thing you should probably look for and this is a good red flag and any real estate guy will tell you this, but people that are, you know, a lawyer or a doctor won't know this, is look at the cap rate, right? Which is like the yield that you're going into on this asset. Look at the cap rate, call it, it's a 5% cap rate that you're going into this investment. Look at their projections going forward and look if they projected that they're going to sell it for a lower cap rate, which is more expensive, for a lower cap rate than they're buying it at, right? So if I tell you, I am buying this at a five cap and in five years, I'm going to sell it at a four cap. What makes it a five cap and a four cap is the market is Jerome Powell right now. It's the Fed, mm -hmm. right? So you want to bet on somebody that the operations of the asset is what's paying your money, mm -hmm. not what the 10 year treasury is going to be four or five years from now. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that the exit cap is higher than the going in cap. Mm -hmm. So that's like, a specific example. And, and like, that's like generalized would be like, you can make money whether the market's up or down, they're going to do things with this property that will improve its value. Correct. And so therefore, even if you're in a worse economic environment, it's still a good deal. Yeah. I mean, there's deals right now that I invested in that were purchased out of four cap and now the market's closer to a five cap. So like the asset value has gone down on paper, but the $2,000 rents that they're going to renovate the units to then charge $3,000 they're renovating those units and they're getting $3,000, mm -hmm. whether the paper value of the building is up or down. So my 8% is getting paid quarterly, mm -hmm. right? And that's what I care about. I can't control what the ex what the cap rate is going to be, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if I tell you, hey, the PE ratio of the stock is 5 PE ratio and when we're going to sell it, it's going to be 20 PE ratio. I'm like, all right, well, are you changing it from a industrial stock to a tech stock? Like, how are you doing that shit? Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, you're not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when you think about a young person who wants to get into real estate, like what's your best advice for them? I do this a lot because on Twitter and stuff like mm -hmm. that. I think you definitely want to, real estate is competitive. Barry Sternlich, I don't know if it was Barry Sternlich of Starwood Capital or David Rubenstein of Carlisle Group, but one of them too had like a commencement address for speech and they basically said like, I look at where all the Harvard graduates and Wharton graduates that could have their pick of their litter of where they want to go to the MBAs and like that industry that everybody wants to go to is the one that I think is overvalued and like due for a crash. Cause that's what all the smart cool kids want to do now. And the reason I mentioned that is because real estate is like a competitive, tough group, like industry to really make 
good, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the average folk is great money. Um, so it's going to be competitive. What's interesting about that is to break in is going to be hard, right? Unless you come from a great school and you've got the background and a connection and all that stuff to break in, it's going to be hard. But if you figure out a way to break in my, I got into real estate in a very atypical way. I was a B student with no internships and I fell into this thing, but I called hundreds of people Mm-hmm. that I read on The Real Deal, the South Florida Business Journal. And I'm like, Mitch Simberg, who runs our entire Florida team, is someone I called in 2015 for advice. Mm-hmm. And then fast forward seven years, and he's like the guy that runs a team that I'm working with. Um, so advice that I would give to a younger person is like, get book recommendations that get you into real estate, that will talk about real estate, and read these books, or look at videos on YouTube about real estate and how these people are making money. And if you're doing that and it's not piquing your interest or your curiosity, quite frankly, like pivot and go, <laughs> go do something else, go do something else. Cause it's yeah. so competitive in here. I tell people, I'm like, dude, if you're failing to break in, even if you manage to break in, you are going to have a really tough time making a lot of money in this industry. Mm-hmm. Cause there's a lot of people that found, figured out a way to break it. Mm-hmm. And those are the people you're going to now be competing with. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's self-selecting that way. But advice would be that for me, when I was not in real estate, I reached out legit first job in real estate company called Lloyd Jones Capital. Mm -hmm. I reached out to the CEO, founder of the company, ignored me, obviously reached out to the CFO, ignored me, obviously reached out to the director of acquisitions, ignored me, obviously reached out to every VP analyst I could find. Nobody replied. Nobody, nobody. Mm -hmm. The intern Riley, the intern reached back out to me like, Hey bro. Yeah. I would love to grab lunch. Go grab lunch with this guy. I come with like my manila folder and resume seven, eight years ago in case the conversation goes well, conversation goes well. I give him my resume. He gives it to the guy. They're calling me in for an interview like a month later. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, this is great. I get in there. They weren't even looking for someone. Mm -hmm. They legit were like, we're not hiring, but we think you're great. Like we like your energy. As I was walking out of that room, Mm -hmm. true story. As I was walking out of that room, I look at the bullpen where the analysts were and there was an empty desk with Mm -hmm. two computer screens that were black. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, who sits there? And the founder, CEO, Chris Finley is like, nobody, it's empty. And I was like, I could, I could sit there and just help you guys out doing whatever, whatever it is you're doing, I'll help. And he's like, seriously? He said, we're not looking for anyone. Like we're not, we can't pay you. And I was like, Don't pay me for the first three months. At the time I was living with my parents, which is fortunate and all these things. But I was like, you don't have to pay me a dollar. I'll go over there and just sit and learn. And then three months from my quote unquote start date, we'll talk about paying me something if you think it's worthy. If not, I'll do what I'm doing now and just go look around and try to find a job. Guy loved it. Mm -hmm. Was like, oh, great. Like, when do you start? And I'm like, I'll be there Monday. It was like a Thursday or something like that. Monday I show up and I'm there at the office. I was in at five, six in the morning. Mm -hmm. I was out of there at eight o'clock at night. I wasn't getting paid a dollar, but it put the fire under my ass, which is like, the only way I'm going to stay here is if I prove that I can be very valuable to this company. Mm -hmm. I spent nights reading loan documents and JV agreements and stuff like that, that we all had access to to just learn the business. And yeah, you you know, the rest is history. Three months later, the guy's giving me a full-time offer. I'm learning the, the business there. I'm cutting my teeth. And then here I am, you know. Does he invest in deals now that you would do? You should go back. And well, that's a, like, yeah, it's a great point. So now I see him. So now my team, we haven't sold deals to him, but my team has financed deals that he's got in like Fort Myers and stuff like that. Yeah. And when I run into him, he's like, Omar, like, how's everything going, bro? A guy loves me. Right. Yeah. And, he, and he sees my success and he's just like, dude, I knew you were like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. were a badass. You were a shark, you know? And I'm just like, thanks. I appreciate it. Like you really helped me out. So like, if you're not doing By the way, that, we have this deal. Do you want to buy it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, by the way, that's, a, that's my whole story. I'm like, oh, are you, are you in the market for something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred percent. I love it. Where can we send people to find more about the team? Like Brocadia itself yeah. is like a pretty big uh, company. Yeah, it's but, a national company. Yeah. But yeah. How, how do they find the South Florida team? Um, South Florida team, honestly, I, I'm happy to be like the source, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, text, email, whatever it is. Where do um, most people go through Twitter? I think Twitter is where I've sort right, of. What's your Twitter handle? It. So it's at Omar Morales, M O R A L E S. Yeah. Do people hit you up on Instagram? On Instagram, dude, a lot. Because you know what? You know why? Really? Because I swear, and more, more. I don't want to say like real players or whatever, but like, yeah, 
basically I, I will post pictures because the thing is that real estate is a very visual mm-hmm. industry, right? So like Twitter is really good for like tech and crypto and all these things, software engineers. And it's great for real estate. So a bunch of big fish on Twitter. Yeah. But on Instagram, what I've noticed helps me the most is like if we follow each other, like a 55 year old founder of a company and I, him and I follow each other. Now I am looking at like the fact that he likes tennis and the fact that this and the fact that that, so it like grows a relationship. And then I slide into the DMS, but instead of like back in my single days, being like a girl or whatever, I'm like sliding into the DM of some like sponsor. And I'm like, yo, let's play tennis. Let's hang out. And it sort of like humanizes the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I've now done deals with people that I've met on Instagram. Literally, mm-hmm. they're like, oh yeah, I see that you're doing a bunch of stuff and we meet for coffee and then, you know, we mm-hmm. go and close the deal. On Twitter, actually, there was a guy that DM'd me on Twitter that like six, seven months later, I was selling a $110 million deal to. Mm-hmm. On Twitter, he DM'd me. And I reached out to my team and I'm like, this guy looks pretty real, pretty legit. So this, I can shout him out. It's Max Sharkansky from Tryon mm-hmm. Properties. Mm-hmm. His last name is literally Shark. Kansky. This guy is a <laughs> Max will legit text me at four in the morning. And then we'll be texting at 11 o'clock at night about a deal. He'll reply at four in the morning. And I'm just like, Max, bro, go to bed. But like, these are the type of guys that I'm yeah. like, dude, this guy is next level. Yeah. If Max is like, yo, do you want to invest in my deal? I'm like, please. I'm like, <laughs> take my money. Yeah. You know, like, it's crazy. So Max I, is a Max is a shark. Shark Hansky. Yeah, he's the best. That's an amazing name. <laughs> That's dumb, yeah. No, and I introduced him to this other guy now, the CIO of True America. His name is Matt Ferrari. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, I got to introduce a shark to this Ferrari. And it was a great conversation. The guys are both studs. It's people that you sit in the room with. I'm sure you've been in the situation yeah. where you're just like, holy shit. Like these people are fucking smart. Yeah. Like, it's that's crazy. every room. Uh, yeah. that, that's uh, that's the only room you want to be in. Yeah. I'm dumb. That's fine. hundred <laughs> percent. That's me here. I'm like, I'm hanging out here. I'm like, all right, this is pretty cool. I just sell real estate. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming and doing this. I think this is super helpful for a lot of people who are interested in real estate or trying to understand how deals work, uh, how the broker versus principal and kind of that trade off. Uh, and then also, like why South Florida. Uh, so anyone who wants to uh, reach out to Omar, Omar Morales on Twitter and uh, maybe slide into his DMs on Instagram as well. <laughs> Whatever you want to. Yeah. And uh, we'll definitely do this again in the future. Perfect. I appreciate you having me here, Bump.